All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caroline Guo, and I am helping organize and orchestrate the webinar today. Uh, thank you all for attending um, and, and standing by, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Infrastructure as Code for VMware with HashiCorp Terraform. Please feel free to type your questions in the question box during the webinar. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, and it'll be made available after post-processing, which is usually within a couple days. <coughs> Our speakers today are Adam Cavalier, uh, Solutions Engineer with HashiCorp, and Grant Orchard, Systems Engineer with VMware. Uh, please also feel free to reach out directly to any of the speakers via Twitter. We've listed their uh, Twitter handles on, on the page here uh, for any follow-up questions. And with that, I'd like to pass it off to Adam to get started. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Carolyn. All right, so let's jump uh, right into talking about the agenda. Um, so just to cover the flow for our discussion today, we're going to cover what it means to have infrastructure as code. And uh, then Grant uh, from VMware is going to provide a uh, brief introduction. And we'll also discuss uh, Terraform, the use cases, and uh, provider overview for VMware. And you know, ultimately, how to use Terraform uh, as usage scales across teams and when we're provisioning infrastructure at scale. And finally, we're going to dive into a demo and answer uh, you know, whatever questions uh, come up from from this presentation. So, uh, with that, let's uh, let's jump into why infrastructure is code. And you know, first, I want to say that uh, I've been working with VMware since uh, ESX 2.5, and so it's fantastic to be on here with Grant talking about Terraform and just uh, seeing the uh, evolution of uh, of VMware's. Uh, Capabilities and so, uh, you know, as we look at just the uh, uh, shift um, to public cloud infrastructure, uh, as you know, over a decade ago it was introduced. Um, it, it really revolutionized uh, what the market was able to do from a speed and efficiency perspective with uh, software application delivery, and the uh, the landscape of infrastructure continues to change towards this dynamic and distributed uh, infrastructure to satisfy the need for these constantly evolving workloads. Uh, but I think we find that, you know, some of the largest enterprises in the world are still maintaining the same practices for provisioning and ultimately managing their infrastructure in their private data centers they did before the cloud revolution. And, and so as organizations adopt many uh, types of cloud, the effort of manual provisioning uh, just becomes tedious and not scalable, uh, you know, let alone uh, what it looks like for day two operations. Uh, you know, and so as we, we look at an organization's workflow, uh, there's still dependencies on operators closing developer created tickets by pointing and clicking in, in GUIs and, and, you know, ultimately dealing with, uh, managing, uh, pr provisioning for virtual machines. And the idea of, of doing that at scale just won't work. And so that's why infrastructure as code is so uh, important because it allows you to automate version and ultimately collaborate on the infrastructure you're creating in the same fashion as the software that's running on top of it. And so as we look at this uh, you know, challenge and, and ultimately the, the solutions here, uh, by moving away from point and click GUIs, we're obviously able to uh, increase productivity because everybody's working off of the, the same playbook. By uh, actually writing down uh, as code what your infrastructure is to be, this means everybody understands exactly um, what is going to be provisioned. And, and ultimately, this means that we're able to understand exactly um, what is going to happen as, uh, as we're provisioning. So this reduces errors as well. So not only are we getting the productivity of uh, the speed to market, but uh, also the, uh, the benefits of, of error correction and then uh, controlling costs. We'll talk a little bit further about how Terraform allows you to really understand what's been provisioned and also being able to uh, tear down uh, things that no longer need to be around. And, and so as we look at how Terraform uh, really takes this uh, codified approach, uh, the idea is that we're writing it in a declarative language. And, and what this means is that we're specifying what we expect the infrastructure to be at the end, and we allow Terraform to determine all the dependencies. And this also means we can be uh, provisioning against a multitude of providers, whether it's uh, things like Kubernetes, 
uh, provisioning into AWS so that we can then set up vSphere along with NSX or even provisioning uh, locally on-prem and, and utilizing the vSphere and NSX providers. And so the idea here is that we utilize Terraform for one workflow to provision across multiple providers and allow Terraform to uh, let us know what the plan is, what's going to be produced, and ultimately let uh, letting Terraform then do that execution as well. And so as we move forward on this and we talk about the use cases of Terraform, it really works best in phase steps. It, the idea at first is that uh, start using infrastructure as code and then start building on top of that. And what we mean about this is that by, by adopting infrastructure as uh, code, you're going to solve those issues around uh, error-prone uh, deployments, tribal knowledge. I, I mean, just in general, thinking about somebody going through and clicking on a GUI and trying to follow, an, uh, a, say, a, a runbook, when instead you can have your, your runbook codified so that the, the person who's provisioning doesn't have to worry that they're doing it slightly different than the, the last person who actually provisioned it. And uh, and so as we move from that and we look at going down this multi-cloud management approach, it really becomes apparent that, you know, as new tools and clouds get adopted, it requires, uh, you know, a lot of respective onboardings and lead times until they provide value. And then along with that, as you look at uh, what, what happens with those tools, they increase risk just because uh, multiple workflows uh, are required to secure, govern, and, and audit those uh, those pieces. And so the idea with Terraform is that you're able to use one standard workflow to provision against uh, whatever cloud platform or cloud solution you're, you're ultimately looking to utilize. And this then uh, flows right into providing a, a much richer self-service infrastructure where developers and operators are have the ability to serve themselves. This really reduces the dependencies on one another and it gets extended as we start to look at things like module reuse and utilizing tools such as Sentinel for uh, uh, establishing policies and, and putting guardrails into place to ensure that we have the, the flexibility of, uh, of trying out new services while still making sure that the uh, organization's uh, requirements around uh, security and, and ultimately the way that things need to be provisioned can be followed. And so, uh, to tie off on this, Terraform follows really three main principles. The, the first, I think I've hit on it a bunch, is that, you know, automation through codification. And so uh, as you move down that path, you're now able to focus on workflows and, and not uh, specific technologies. And uh, this then leads into uh, being able to use a, uh, a very open and extensible community of providers and contributors. And so uh, I'm going to hand this over to uh, Grant now to uh, talk a little bit about the vSphere provider itself. Brilliant. Thanks, Adam. So here we can see uh, the vSphere provider, uh, or at least a snippet that's been taken from uh, the Terraform Docs site. And as you can see, it looks exactly like any other uh, provider would for Terraform. Uh, so the standard first stands are there talking about our credentials. Uh, for those of you who aren't quite so stringent with your certificates, not anybody I know who uh, who uses self-signed certs in production, of course, uh, but you're all, you're able to do things like saying, yeah, we, we still trust um, any unverified SSL certificates that come through. Uh, so just having a level of control over your connection there. There are certain things within uh, a vSphere environment that you're probably not going to be managing. Uh, it's not going to have a high churn rate. It's not going to change significantly over time. Uh, so things like the vSphere data center, um, that there is listed as a data source. So we're going to need to understand information about it uh, because when you're doing provisioning of other objects, uh, things like um, your managed object IDs all refer back to the upper level containers such as your data centers. Uh, such as your resource pools and so on. So effectively, we've got the ability to identify um, those non-changing objects as data sources. We can enter the name, we can discover them, and then we can reference their attributes for the more dynamic objects. So if you look down towards the bottom stanza there, you can see an example of uh, probably where you're going to get started. Um, and to Adam's point about that sort of journey that you go on with regards to um, sort of starting small and then growing your footprint, that idea of getting started with uh, a virtual machine is probably where we see most people actually beginning when it comes to using Terraform uh, with vSphere or VMware technologies in general. 
So you're able to identify, uh, you know, the provisioning type. We're able to identify where we want it to be provisioned. Uh, and some of the things that you don't see on screen there uh, are even more granular capabilities whereby you could actually utilize affinity rules. So that if you had licensing requirements to have a workload on a particular cluster, um, then you can actually make sure that it lands there using DRS affinity rules. Uh, so there's, there's a massive, massive number of resources and this is just a very small snapshot um, of the provider that's actually there. Now, while the vSphere provider is probably where most people are going to get started, uh, if we look further, um, and in fact, the next topic that we're going to talk about today, that's not actually moving across for me, Adam, would you mind just uh, taking the slide over? Oh, there we go. The NSXT provider. Uh, so we're going to spend a bit of time on this, uh, demo this and dig into it in a little more detail. Uh, but again, similarly, we've got the same idea around the provider. So you, you can authenticate as you would through standard username and password. Uh, you, you can make use of environment variables to actually um, abstract and, and hide some of those sensitive details within your definitions. And you can also make use of uh, client certificates as, as another means of actually authenticating. So beyond that, um, there's again, a vast range of different resources um, as well as data sources in the NSXT provider, which we'll dig into again uh, in more detail during the demo and subsequent slides. Now, while those two, uh, vSphere and NSXT, are the focus of today's session, uh, there are a number of other providers that are also available uh, for Terraform uh, in the VMware ecosystem. So vCloud Director, which is uh, a large part of our service provider market um, and our partners go to market, is also available. Uh, while we don't have any screenshots for it as well, we have um, the default OpenStack provider would work with VMware integrated OpenStack. And similarly, the Pivotal Kubernetes um, the pivotal Kubernetes um, solution that we have in play would work with the standard Kubernetes provider for Terraform also. And so, right, so I'll back to you here. Yep. Yeah. And so as we look at uh, some of those examples, especially what uh, Grant just went over in terms of the uh, the uh, vSphere. Uh, code that was there, we can take that and turn it into a module, which ultimately makes this a, uh, a reusable, uh, templatized set of uh, infrastructure. And the idea here is that you're, you're able to utilize these modules uh, to create uh, specific ways that we expect um, infrastructure to be consumed by different teams. Now, this can be something uh, as specific as, say, uh, we have an example of a storage module here but it can also be uh, a, a very rich module that is uh, built out for uh, deploying a specific type of application. And the ability to take these uh, modules and then consume them uh, really comes in, in two different flavors. The, uh, the module registry uh, itself that's public is out at uh, registry.terraform.io. And I uh, highly encourage you to go out there and check it out. I, I actually have found that it's uh, spurred on some ideas of how to create Terraform code just because uh, you can see some of the ways that uh, resources have been uh, built in into one specific module. And, uh, and then the other side of this is the private module registry. And this is for enterprise users where uh, the desire is to say, these are our internal modules that have been created and they're ultimately built for uh, consumption by application teams that are going to get um, uh, very specific settings uh, in them and, and ways that are going to uh, really be customized for that, uh, that enterprise setting. And, and one thing to note is you can actually import uh, modules into the uh, private module registry from uh, public repos as well, if that was a, a desire. And, and so, um, you know, as we go down this path and, and we talk about modules and we also uh, talk about enterprises consuming uh, this infrastructure as code approach, we usually find that uh, there's some challenges they run into and, and that's when they start to really uh, look at Terraform Enterprise. And so the first one comes to uh, collaboration. And, and when we look at collaboration, it, it really uh, revolves around being able to not only share the, the same code, but also understand how uh, that code's been written and, and utilizing a version control system uh, enables a, a fantastic way to uh, collaborate 
on this and, and then linking that version control system to workspaces uh, allows for uh, different teams to uh, see the state of the, uh, the infrastructure itself. Uh, past that, uh, when we talk about leveraging each other's work, that comes back to the, the whole module registry and, uh, and also uh, being able to uh, utilize things like our, our role-based access control. And then uh, finally, the uh, um, policy and governance uh, revolves around uh, not only that, that first uh, thing I just mentioned on role-based access control, but also uh, Sentinel policy as code where you can set up the guardrails to really say, this is what's allowed to be done. Uh, we've had customers that have given examples of, we only want provisioning to happen uh, at, at these times of days for the, these environments. And so you can then have Sentinel policies there that, that lock that down. You can also limit potentially what modules are able to be used. There's uh, there, really whatever you can envision being controlled, uh, it, it can be written with, uh, with Sentinel. And so uh, as we take this one step further and think through a, uh, a workflow, uh, this is a really fantastic image that, that describes what uh, you know, day in the life of different uh, actors would be uh, utilizing Terraform. So you've got policy owners, they can commit their policies out to the uh, version control system. Those policies then can be uh, um, pushed out to Terraform Enterprise uh, as the Sentinel policies. and uh, and we'll be sitting there waiting to be run against any jobs that would be planned and applied. And then along with that, you have infrastructure operators. These are the people that really understand uh, all the different uh, requirements for provisioning within the infrastructure. You know, Grant mentioned before about uh, having uh, specific uh, rules about where uh, resources could be provisioned to. Uh, you could have modules that are built that, that would have part of that uh, knowledge in them. So they're going to put those out there into the version control system and then publish them through the, the private module registry. They might also want to uh, utilize direct resources and provision some very static types of infrastructure, say like network. I, I think it's a great example where the network, uh, you might have uh, very uh, specific uh, like root pieces of the network that might need to be consumed that aren't as uh, dynamic as something like NSX. And, uh, and so there could be a, a reason for having those out there. But then you have your consumer uh, who is going to want to consume these pieces. And this is where they can have workspaces that are a part of development, staging, and production. These three workspaces could all refer back to the same code repository and use branching, much like our application developers have used for, you know, really ever. They've, uh, they've seen the benefits of code promotion. We should use code promotion for our infrastructure as well, because then we can we can truly test as we're moving from one environment to the next and know it's going to look the same. And so uh, we can see here an example of that where the application workspace is consuming some of those private modules. Now, once we uh, go and do a, a Terraform plan and apply, that's where Sentinel will kick in, make sure that everything's good to go. And when that apply kicks off, you can see all the different uh, providers out there that we can uh, programmatically go against. And, and so I'll give a little bit more of an example of that, but I want uh, to give Grant the uh, ability to go through NSX uh, in some more depth and, uh, and ultimately show some examples of that. Brilliant. All right. Thanks again, Adam. So look, I think um, what I wanted to sort of show you here and, and dig into a little bit is, I guess, to highlight, um, you know, something that, that might actually be a, a typical simple topology um, for, from an NSX perspective and just show you some of the complexity that's actually involved if you were to try and be working with this um, and actually being prescriptive uh, and you know, scripting this rather than actually doing something declarative, so working in a more imperative model, all the different things that you would actually need to take into account. Uh, so we're just going to walk through this, again, very simple topology and, and map out um, what each of these actually resources look like um, within the Terraform provider and, and give you, I guess, a little bit of a, a sneak peek into what our definition looks like that we're going to be provisioning uh, very shortly. Apologies, I'm coming in from uh, Sydney here and it appears the uh, transatlantic latency is playing a little bit of havoc. So here we go. So first of all, we've got our T0 router. So this is something that, again, similar to um, a data center when you're thinking about um, vSphere objects, is something that's going to be pre-provisioned. Pre it's something that you're going to want to use as a data source. You're going to want to interact with it 
but you're not actually going to be provisioning it. It's not a highly dynamic object. So we can see here, we've got the data source created. We put in the display name, um, and when we run any of our Terraform commands, um, be it refresh, be it plan, be it apply, it's gonna go out and, and query um, our NSX manager and look for that object and make sure that it's actually got the state available for us to interact with. The next thing that we see there is um, actually having the link between our T0 and the T1 router, which we're about to get to. So unlike previous versions of um, NSX, when you needed to actually attach each of your um, routers to each other via a logical switch, uh, NSXT is a lot more clever about that. And, and it allows you to sort of infer the relationship by saying, right, here are the logical router link ports um, on my T0 router, my T1 router, um, and create a relationship between those. And it actually handles all, all of um, that traffic and creation automatically for you. So here we can see that rather than using this as a data source, it's not something that exists, it's something that we're going to create dynamically, uh, that is a resource. Uh, and if we look towards the bottom there, you can see that I'm actually making use of tags um, just to flag that this is actually being created by Terraform. Now, you know, you might think how necessary is that or how realistic is that as an example. Um, it's quite valuable because especially when you start looking at the different use cases where NSXT plays, um, if you happen to have, um, you know, Kubernetes running within the environment, which you'll see in the lab environment that we'll go into uh, shortly, there will be a, a mammoth amount of objects. And so understanding which objects relate to what, um, tagging is just a very good way to understand and be able to search and query for, for the right objects that you're actually looking for. So similar to the, um, the router port link that we had previously, we can see here the one that's been created for our T1 router. And if we look at the third line down, we can see the linked logical router, uh, router port ID, which is looking back up to our, our T0 um, link port ID. So that's where that relationship comes in and that's how it, it automatically maps through for, for the traffic routing. We've got the T1 router itself, where we're able to configure and identify uh, which routes we actually want to advertise, um, which of the edge clusters this is actually being provisioned to. Um, there's actually a number of other um, optional parameters in here, but for the sake of brevity, we've just kept it quite simple. Uh, but what this means is that if we were to look at something like advertised connected uh, routes, the minute that we take this fairly simple topology and say, right, I don't just want one network segment off the back of my tier one router. Um, what I actually want is three or four, and we go in and we iterate on our Terraform definition, all of the routes associated with those network segments would automatically be published um, and available so that any traffic could be automatically routed through to that um, on demand the minute that provisioning actually finishes. So the downstream, uh, the downlink router port, so again, you get the idea. We can see here that we actually specify the IP address. So this is where we actually get the information about the subnet that the logical switch is gonna be running on. Um, and in fact, when we go through and provision this in the demo, um, I'll switch over to the lab and show you, you know, pinging this address, just making sure that uh, this has actually come up um, and that it is actually a real live demo. Uh, finally, the last couple of items that we have here um, are the logical switch itself. So again, we need to look at the transport zone that we're actually using to provision this into. We need to look at the replication mode to make sure that the logical switch is actually available across all hosts in the cluster. Um, and uh, yeah, basically identify that as well as the final logical port switch to identify that that's actually been connected up um, upstream to the router. So if you're not familiar with NSXT, that probably sounds a bit confusing. Um, but once you actually start to get more familiar with it, um, it's a model that, again, if you're familiar with OpenStack um, and the atomic level controls that you have over networking constructs, then that probably all makes a fair amount of sense. But it just sort of highlights the amount of detail that's involved with automating uh, something like an NSXT network. And again, this is a very simple example. As you get to far more complex topologies, obviously this is just going to grow exponentially. So being able to work declaratively with something like Terraform means that you're gonna get a very reliable outcome. And again, if you start to move into um, use of modules such as Adam was talking about, then again, you actually get much greater scale and it's much easier to consume uh, for a number of people to, to have these modules available um, and get a very repeatable, reliable outcome. All right, Adam, I might flick back to you from there. All right, thanks, Grant. And so, uh, 
everything that we've uh, really talked about today, especially with the vSphere provider, NSXT uh, provider, uh, and really any provider you, you can find out here under uh, this link, you can utilize with the uh, open source version of Terraform. And so I highly encourage you to uh, go out, download Terraform, and, uh, and, and give this a try. And um, it's, uh, there's a, a rich community as well that you can uh, lean on if you have questions. And, uh, and, so, and we're happy to answer some questions at the, uh, the end around this as well. So, Grant, I can make you, I'll actually stop sharing my screen. I'll let you present. Brilliant, thank you. All righty. Okay, so that looks like it's showing up, okay. So what we'll do here is just take a look at um, an existing config that I have. I'm just gonna make a few modifications here so that we can uh, iterate slightly over what we're actually doing. Uh, but what you'll note is that on screen, uh, the exact samples that we had in the previous um, previous few screens actually talking through this um, are all actually literally cut and paste out of this working sample. Uh, so you can see I've got a provider configured here for vSphere, uh, for NSXT. Um, we're just making use of variables as opposed to environment variables, which again, Adam will get into shortly. We've got our data sources set up. Um, so a couple of things that I didn't talk about um, largely just because it's a bit harder to visualize and this isn't really meant to be an, an NSX lesson per se. Um, things like actually having data sources for your NSXT edge cluster um, and for the transport zone as well. So we've got all of those set up. All right, and let's just make sure I've cut and paste the right part because I was cutting out our data sources there. All right, so all I'm doing there is just removing the virtual machine. Um, it just takes a little bit of time to provision and I want to get this um, up and running quite quickly. So one thing that I like to do, um, and this is just personal taste when it comes to working with things like data sources, um, I've already done my Terraform in it. What I like to do is just a simple Terraform refresh. So what that will actually do is go off and query um, to see what data sources are actually available. So if I now come back into my definition, we'll see that a TF state file has been created. We can see that that edge cluster data source has actually come up. Um, we can see that my T0 router is, is in there and described accurately uh, and so on. I'm not gonna take you through each of the objects. Uh, but that for me is just a nice way to know that everything is, is up and running as I anticipate it being. So what I'm gonna do next is actually flip back in here and do a quick Terraform plan. So again, that goes off and refreshes the state. Um, and we can see each of the objects that we actually sort of walked through um, are coming up in a different order, which is not a problem um, in terms of just how that's, that's outputting. But these are the same objects that we actually looked at during the presentation. So we have the logical port, we have the downlink port, um, we have the IP address that's actually going to be used, uh, and so on and so forth. So we can see here that the plan is giving us all the detail. There's gonna be six new objects created no changes, no destroys. Um, and what I'm just gonna do quickly, again, I like to prove to people that this stuff is real. So we can see if I ping that at the moment, 192.168.205.1, we're not actually getting anything. So no response there. And if I come back across and I do my Terraform reply, and what I'll do is auto approve, just auto dash approve, just so I don't have to wait for that. We can see that all creating. All happens quite quickly. And if I come across here, what we'll do next is just a quick query. So you'll remember that we had the tags in place and I mentioned that there are like a number of objects. So this is a fairly small lab environment. Um, and yet when you look at it, we can see you know, things that we've got in play at the moment, three load balances, uh, 21 virtual servers, um, server pools from a load balancing point of view, firewall rules, the switch ports, et cetera, et cetera. There's a you know, reasonable amount of content for even a small environment. So just being able to come in and do a search for Terraform and see that immediately this has come up. Now I could go and query this logical router ID or look for it in the state and I would actually see that coming up. Um, 
yes to answer the question that you're probably wondering, um, can I assign a friendly name to this? Absolutely, it's an optional parameter that you can describe. Um, it just made my file a little bit shorter, a little bit smaller to actually fit on the PowerPoint slide, so I left it out. But we can see all the information about that. Uh, same thing would occur if I come over here and take a look at the switching. I can just do a search now for Terraform and we can see the one logical switch that was created as part of that simple topology has come up. So again, just to prove that that is now working, let me do the same ping. And thankfully, the demo gods have smiled on me today and we can see that that's come up as expected. Um, so super simple example of the topology. Um, and again, I think what you would really want to look at when you start to productionize this is consider modules, consider standardized topologies, uh, consider the services that you need to consume. Um, NSX isn't just about provisioning routers and switches. Um, there are a number of other services that are available. So just being able to um, understand, identify, um, and visualize that to start with, and then use that as a starting point to build out modules uh, for people to use in a, a very repeatable manner. Um, and in that way, you get a self-contained uh, development environment that includes both your compute and your networking um, as part of that stack. So very powerful um, and a, a great way to make use of the Terraform provider. All right. Now, the one thing I'll do now is come back in. Um, we will undo that change. So you can see now we've actually got a virtual machine in there. Um, a bit of different information that we require in order to provision that. If I run my Terraform plan again, we should see that one change or one addition will come through. There we go, one to add, zero to change, zero to destroy. So I can do my Terraform apply auto approve. I can, I can feel Adam shaking his head at me for using auto approve. But uh, when I flip between screens, it's just nice to not have to remember to, uh, to confirm that. So here we are in our vCenter UI, um, and we can see straight away that that's actually popped up with that TF01 machine. Um, and we can see that that's cloning um, from our Ubuntu 16.04 template. Um, that'll take a little while to come up. But again, so we can definitely do things like making sure that we interpolate from the logical switch, um, attach our virtual machine network interface to the logical switch that's been provisioned, um, and get that full stack uh, integration as, as part of your definition. So with that, Adam, um, I don't want to sit here and watch paint dry. Uh, I might flip it back over to you and uh, you can take us through Terraform Enterprise. Perfect. All right, let me uh, start sharing my screen. All right, so uh, first, I want to show an example of what this module uh, actually looks like so we can see um, a little bit of how we're, we're consuming modules. And, and so uh, what we have here is uh, it's really close to what Grant uh, went through before, right, where we've got the provider being defined uh, with vSphere. Uh, but what's interesting here is I'm not actually providing any usernames, passwords, or um, server settings, and you'll see where I, I'm able to provide those uh, in a different place. And, and this helps from just an overall uh, security perspective where you know our, our best practices just don't hard code your uh, credentials into the, uh, the source code itself. You can also see uh, where we have a few things that are actually hard coded, uh, even things like the data store where normally probably wouldn't do a single data store, you might do like a, a storage pool, something like that. But uh, in general, these are things we typically don't want our end users to worry about, and we've even set this up so that there's variables uh, rather than hard-coded values for things that we want to allow our end users to be able to provide uh, information into. Uh, we can even see uh, the variables themselves being defined, disk size, it has uh, you know very specifics, and so all this is written uh, in a way that is, is meant to be easily consumed. And if we take a look at how this module looks inside of uh, Terraform Enterprise, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to see how it's easy for uh, application users, et cetera, to be able to jump in and start grabbing modules. So on the right-hand side here, we've got the, uh, the uh, Terraform Enterprise interface. 
and I'm going to go into modules. And I just have this one module uh, in this environment provision. We can see it. I've called it AppX, and it's a Terraform vSphere module. And if I uh, go in here and start looking at the details, I can see uh, how the uh, the module example can be utilized, where I'm showing that this is the source. And so the benefit of this is that Terraform Enterprise becomes the source for this uh, this particular module, and we can then version it. So we can allow users to use a specific version we've, we've published. And as we make modifications, they can uh, choose to move up on the version or stay on the old one if there's a reason for them to do so. And we can even go look at the source code of this and see uh, how this is, uh, is out there today. So we can see this is literally the, the same code I was just going over with you is, uh, is what's published up here. And, uh, and you can see here's my example of the uh, uh, module as well. So uh, by going in here, we can also see that there are uh, the inputs, uh, just like it was written. But this makes it very easy for an end user to come in and see, well, here are the defaults. Uh, quickly going through, and they can even go uh, back to uh, utilizing our design configurator to uh, really lay out exactly what pieces they need to uh, add into these modules. So you can imagine you have multiple modules through here. You can even search for, for uh, modules. We'll just add this one in. We'll go through this, and, uh, and we can configure variables. And right away, we, uh, we have at the top the uh, required variables that need to be provided. So the, the VM count and the VM name. So we could you know, put in number two, and we could type in something like example app. At this point, when I come in and I click next, I can see what this configuration looks like. It's pretty simplistic. I, I've specified the name of the module using the latest version, and uh, I just have these, these two pieces that need to be provided. If we take this and look at how I, I extended it, let me come back to the code here. I've got two different examples of this code. I've got a staging environment. And, and if we look at the staging environment, we can see that I've got two iterations of this module. So if you think of code reuse, uh, this is a perfect example of this, where I'm not having to rewrite all that code. I'm just specifying this is the module, application one. I've provided the VM name and the VM count, but I also wanted to uh, provide a few other pieces. Uh, giving the tagging name of staging and you know a few other uh, uh, settings along with that I needed another set of VMs to be provisioned three of them for my mid tier and I've given a, a few different settings here I could even change this to say you know like said I only want two uh, CPUs and so uh, Terraform Enterprise uh, provides a pretty rich way of interacting with it either you can do everything through uh, linking to source code so if we come here and we say um, we look at this workspace. This workspace uh, is linked back to uh, GitHub, and we can see that I'm linked to this uh, this particular repository. And I can do a queue plan on this, and it's going to uh, utilize the code that's out there and start doing a plan. The uh, other way we can do this is by utilizing uh, the actual command line. And so if we look at this and we see uh, the files that I have out here, I've got main.tf, and I also have this backend.tf. I'm going to explain that one in a second. Let me run Terraform, and I'm going to run and apply. And, and actually, before I do this, I'm going to do exactly uh, what Grant did at the command line. I'm going to come over to my staging workspace, and I'm going to allow for an auto-apply. And the benefit of this is if, you're, if you've got a staging environment or maybe a dev environment, uh, as long as the plan works out, Let's, let's let it go uh, forward and just apply the settings that we've, uh, we've done. So I'm going to save this and allow for Terraform Enterprise to just do an auto apply. So here when I, uh, when I hit Terraform apply, it's actually linking back out to Terraform Enterprise. And just to uh, walk through the code, that backend.tf, um, just so you understand how this is set up, uh, we're setting up a configuration of Terraform. So it's this uh, Terraform stanza. And then the back end is, is remote, and I'm linked to the SE organization at this URL. And, uh, and then from that, the uh, workspaces itself, uh, I'm specifying the name of the workspace I want to provision into. So we could choose to even uh, provision into a, a, a fully separate workspace if we wanted to. This makes it very easy to uh, reiterate on, on different pieces of code and, and reuse it. So here we can see uh, that the Terraform apply has linked back into uh, the ptfe.demo.rocks. 
environment and it's going through and it's done a plan if we come out to this uh, current run it's going to ask me to uh, refresh and we can actually see it's running right here and we can see that the plans run through I can even view the plan so if you think of it from also an auditing perspective all of the plans get saved within Terraform Enterprise so uh, you know if you plan something and you're expecting one thing to happen and then you go and make some code, code changes and then do another uh, you know plan and apply there, there's a history that something actually changed and we can we can see what happened there and along with that we can now see that the the apply is is going through and you can actually see that the vms are are being provisioned over here um, the one thing to note is i never finished off on the uh, application one dash prod and this one doesn't allow for an auto to apply so in this one i ran i ran this queue plan up here we can see that the plan is has run through I'm also doing five more VMs as part of this, and we can see all the different uh, parts that are going to come out of it. And uh, and so I can come down here, and I have the ability to leave the comments, and I can also um, just say confirm and apply. So now we're going to see five more VMs getting provisioned out in the uh, vSphere environment. Uh, one thing to note on these workspaces is there's a, a lot of things that you can gain out of uh, looking at each one of these tabs. The first one is you can see all the, the history of runs out there. You can see uh, every time that uh, uh, environment was uh, built out, every time it was destroyed, uh, we can see the state. And this is the, the, exactly how the environment was configured. And this is what Terraform uses to understand what might need to be modified. If an end user comes out here and says, you know what, I'm just gonna delete one of these VMs in the GUI, Terraform has the state to say, wait a minute, you just deleted one of those VMs out there. And so the next time that it runs, it's going to realize that it needs to uh, actually add that VM right back in. Along with that, the uh, from a variables perspective, this is a fantastic way from a security um, capability to put sensitive variables out there. You can see right here, I've got vSphere user, password server. And uh, you know, a great example of, of being sensitive is that the password is marked uh, as uh, write only, so no longer can a human read this. Only uh, through a Terraform plan and apply can it actually be accessed. And along with that, there's the ability to have uh, whatever other variables that you're going to use for a Terraform uh, um, plan and apply uh, up here. And so, um, with that. Uh, I think we've hit upon all the things we really wanted to uh, to touch upon today. And um, I did see a few questions uh, as we we were uh, going through this, and I wanna answer one of them um, just because I, I can answer it pretty quickly with my, my screen still showing. Um, and the, the question was around, um, you know, if we have a lot of uh, release swim lanes, how do you use Terraform for different environments easily? And so uh, if we look here under version control, we can see the VCS branch that can be set. And then from a, a GitHub perspective, we're able to uh, have different branches. So I can actually have a branch here that would, you know, whatever you, you create, right? If it's, it's dev, whatever it is, um, and we were to come in here and we had this dev branch and I've got, um, oh, actually I did it on the uh, actual, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, module itself. So let me do it on this. So this is actually the uh, code using the module. So if I come out here and I modify this, well, I'm doing this on the fly, I would have, uh, so if I make this dev and I come in here and I can modify this and let's say that instead I want to change this to CPU count of uh, four. Um, when I commit this change, because I did this to the dev branch, Terraform Enterprise won't actually react to that because it's linked to that dev branch. Um, normally you wouldn't go and change this on prod, you'd have role-based access control to make sure people aren't doing this, but um, just to show you an example of this, I can change this to uh, link to the uh, dev branch. And at this point, it will kick off a plan and we'll see what it wants to change. So Take this one step further, each workspace can be linked to a different uh, one of your um, uh, release uh, swim lanes, and then you're able to commit code within those. You can see right here, 
number of CPUs, two to four. So we know exactly what's going to happen and we can say confirm and apply and it'll go out there and do that. Um, and one other thing, and this gets into some advanced pieces, but you can even, uh, through pull requests, it fully links with that. So you can even see a full uh, life cycle of understanding what the plans will be before you even commit the code upstream into the next uh, set of uh, um, swim lines. So that's uh, hopefully a quick answer on that one. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adam and Grant. Um, so we did see a few other questions come into the, the Q&A section, so we can cover some of those now. Um, and I know, Adam, you just covered one of them, but one that did come in was, are there any publicly available vSphere modules? So from, from my knowledge, uh, today there aren't any specifically out on red, the uh, registry.terraform.io, um, but I believe I've heard that that is planned to change, but I, 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 I'm not sure if Grant knows more than I do on that. Um, yeah, so I, so I also believe that uh, vSphere module has been created and is currently in GitHub, um, but it, it will be published to the registry pretty soon. Um, so I think that is coming shortly from, from our side. Um, another question we have is, um, should we store passwords in Vault? Yeah, by all means. I mean, that's a fantastic way to uh, uh, really utilize uh, Terraform to its fullest extent where you can utilize the, the Vault provider and the Vault provider will uh, then uh, run as part of a, a plan and apply to go out and grab the appropriate secrets and and then uh, they can be used at runtime. Awesome. Um, we have another question around uh, the comparison. So Terraform and Ansible are often uh, two infrastructures code tools that are compared. Um, can you explain what makes Terraform stand out for VMware deployments? So my take, and Grant, I don't know if you have also a, uh, an opinion on this, but w one of the things that really stands out is uh, the fact that the, uh, the state is actually tracked. And, and I give that example of going out and deleting a VM. And, and so uh, across the board, um, Terraform is able to not only track that state, but it also, uh, from a declarative approach, uh, is going to understand exactly the dependencies it needs to uh, actually make changes. So uh, both of those combined makes it really powerful for uh, something like VMware. Great. Uh, our next question is, um, is network interface always considered as a sub-resource? <laughs> um, there's a couple follow-up questions there. And we can't put a count to uh, create multiple interfaces, and is there a plan to support count for sub-resources as well? Yeah, so I, I don't know if you've been keeping up with um, the blogs that have been coming out recently uh, around Terraform.12. Uh, I highly recommend everybody who's familiar with Terraform today uh, to go out and, and check it out, and, and I'll say anybody new as well. There's uh, a lot of great uh, changes coming uh, down the pike for that, and, and actually uh, rather soon. So, uh, highly recommend um, reading up on that 12 because I, I think it will answer and, and solve for some of these things. Awesome. Uh, there's also a couple of questions around whether the recording and slides will be available, and the answer to that is yes. Um, we will be sending out the recording as well as the slides a couple of days after the the webinar. So, look out for that email. Um, we have another question around, so it looks like for Grant, any idea when the content library source will be available for Terraform? Um, that I don't actually know. Um, I know that that's something that is definitely being uh, looked at and worked on, but um, I would need to check in on exactly when that's anticipated to drop. Okay, no worries. Um, yeah, if, if we get the answer to that within the couple next couple of days, we can certainly include that information in our follow-up email. 
Um, let's see. Can you say more about your workflow for keeping secrets out of your Terraform code? <clears throat> sure. So the uh, actual uh, VMware provider is going to look at multiple places uh, for your uh, for specifically uh, three things: the vSphere user, password, and uh, server. And so you can store those in uh, environment variables, and that's that's what I did there. So if you're doing this locally on your machine, you could actually uh, create those as environment variables, and they can be uh, referenced specifically there. Um, with Terraform Enterprise, you're able to uh, then store those. Uh, you can even do it programmatically when you're creating workspaces. So that's something I didn't hit upon, but uh, when a workspace gets created, you wouldn't even need end users to understand it because the, the usernames and passwords and everything, because that could actually be applied as part of a build of a workspace. Um, and then uh, the, the last part, there, there was a question about uh, specifically Vault being able to uh, um, access and so you're able to use things like interpolation with terraform to uh to use the vault provider to go out and, and reference those specifically um and you can feel free to hit me up on uh um uh, twitter as well uh you've got my uh um, handle but it's adam cavalier as well and and i'd be happy to dive in deeper on that question great thank you uh, I think we can cover a couple more questions here. Um, how and where do you store and manage your state files? Correct. Um, yeah, so that's a, a great question. Uh, there's a multitude of open source ways that uh, end users uh, will, will go about trying that. Um, one of the things that can be a concern is uh, how do you secure those because they are um, they, they can contain some pretty sensitive uh, um, pieces of information. And so uh, with Terraform Enterprise, it actually uses Vault on the back end to uh, encrypt all of those files uh, at rest. And so it's a, it's a very secure way of not only storing those, but it also deals with locking, which is a whole nother thing that I didn't really touch upon. Uh, but the, uh, the idea of a state file is that it is the source of truth for your infrastructure. And so if there's like three people all referencing a state file um, on their own, on their own desktops, they all are going to be operating in some weird world where uh, the reality is, is not true for two of them. So, um, you know, from that perspective, having a, a central place that not only stores it, deals with blocking, but also deals with the encryption of it. Is, uh, is key, and that's why Terraform uh, Enterprise is uh, really important. Awesome. Um, I think we can take about two more here. Um, what is the best GitHub source to read more Terraform files, samples, please? So I, I've got a few examples out there. Um, mine probably aren't that, like, complicated though to uh, really get deep. Um, I would say, uh, I'd, and grant, from a documentation standpoint, I think the documentation that's been created around the providers has been just fantastic. Um, so I'm not sure if you have any uh, specific repos you can recommend. Um, to be honest, I, I tend to go to the Terraform registry um, for a lot of this stuff. I mean, when you, when you bear in mind the fact that Modules are really just definitions that you're, you know, referencing in a particular way. Um, a lot of the work that's been done by some of the really smart guys, um, I know Yevgeny has, has done a bunch of work, um, and some of the console examples on AWS um, as Terraform definitions specifically are a really good way to, to get a handle on good examples, um, how to do clever variable insertion, um, and, and so on. So I'd, I'd definitely recommend going there. Um, when you go to the registry, there is a link to the GitHub repos that each of the modules are stored in. Uh, so you can go and, and reference that. Okay. Uh, and then I think this will be our, our last question for today. Um, is there a way to auto discover resources for a provider in Terraform? Can Terraform import be used for that? Um, yeah, so, so go, go on, Adam. no, no, go for it, Grant. Go for it. Oh, sure. Um, so I'm not sure if you noticed the difference there between some of the resources that we were we were using. Some of them started off with um, the data um, 
you know, I'll call it a keyword because I'm not quite sure what the right term to use is, and some of them were resource. So when you use data, um, typically you say data, the resource type, um, and then you give it a name, and it will actually go off and query um, the provider details to say to, to go through and look for an object type that matches that particular name. So you can definitely do that for a data source if it's not something that you want to manage. So that's the, the first possibility. Um, and the second is, yes, absolutely, you can import and then it becomes a resource um, that you can you can make changes to um, and, and actually manipulate and modify within your definition. Great. Yeah, and you can usually see examples of import and everything at the bottom of uh, all of the uh, documentation that's out there, uh, if it's available for a, a particular uh, resource. Okay, awesome. Um, I, I think we actually have time for one more question, so I can s slide when we're in here. And, and for the rest of the folks, uh, I know that there's a lot that have come in, so if there are direct questions that we didn't get to answer, feel free to reach out to some of the speakers today. Um, but our, our last question for today, um, what can I do when my architecture is based in microservices and I need to do CI of each microservice represented in several repositories? Uh, I'm I'm reading through this. I can't say that. Um, so so from a vSphere perspective, are you? I guess it's hard to ask a, a follow-up question. This, but I'm trying to understand specifically: are these microservices then based on specific VMs, um, or is this just a general ter Terraform question? Um, I think I need to ask like a further question to understand a little bit more about that. Yeah, let, let's assume that it's a Terraform one um, for now. And then if there's any follow-ups to that, we can take that offline. Yeah, so I mean, I guess yeah, if, if we assume that each of the constructs can be represented um, differently, I mean, I think, um, Broadly speaking, this is probably a conversation that requires way more discussion um, than we can than we can do within a few minute response. Um, but I think what would be a sensible way to approach something like that would be that you could actually put each of your um, microservice definitions into its own um, TF file, because in that way, um, you know, the, the way Terraform actually works is that it will combine all the TF files into that sort of end state definition, which is then applied. Um, so what that gives you is a bit more flexibility around modifications to an individual TERTS service um, that's an individual file within that repo. So then you could have um, you know, unique triggers um, potentially for your um, CI and, and your CD pipelines um, to trigger off each of those individual files. And then all it would be is performing um, the plan and the apply, and that apply would actually still just be the diff between what you've um, got running in state at the moment um, and what you've changed within that particular definition. So the the actual model doesn't change so much, but it just becomes a question of which way makes the most sense to represent your microservices in order to have you know good control, visibility and understanding of um, the Terraform definition as it relates to, to each of those individual services. Awesome. Great, well thank you so much, um, Grant and Adam. Uh, those were uh, some really great questions from the audience overall. Uh, so I hope everyone enjoyed today's webinar and uh, overall have a better understanding of how Terraform can be used with VMware providers. Um, as I mentioned during the beginning, the, the webinar was recorded and we will make the recording available on our website um, and as well as through email to all the registrants after processing. <coughs> uh, have a great day everyone and thank you so much.